I'm about halfway through now, maybe a little bit more. Try to use the full length of the saw. Try to use your body and your momentum as you're doing it. And try to remember to breathe, <laughs> like they say in yoga. Hey, it's Greg here with MaritimeGrinding.com and I thought I'd do a video today talking about uh, making the most of what you got. Uh, having a garden in a spot, wherever you are, it's some kind of microclimate. It's probably a little bit different on your property as, than it is on someone else's property. And uh, you might have shady spots, sunny spots, uh, you, due to your proximity to uh, major bodies of water, that sort of thing, you might have more fog or less fog than other places, more rain, less rain than other places. And, uh, but what I really want to talk about is sun. Um, your plants need sun, <laughs> right? Uh, people often ask me, I have a garden in this spot and it doesn't get any sun, and, and what can I do? What should I plant? And my, my first answer is always, well, why'd you put the garden there? You should put the garden on the sunniest spot on your property. I mean, you know, if you're in some place like Texas or a place that's always hot and always sunny sort of thing, uh, a hot place, maybe you have different concerns, but I'm talking more specific to people growing in a, uh, you know, colder regions with uh, shorter growing seasons and uh, maybe conditions that affect it even, even though um, the, the length of the day might be right for growing. Uh, you might not get good sun all day because it's overcast or whatever, so you have to make the most of the sun you've got. And I've done a number of things in my garden to make the most of that. Uh, one thing I do is I use these different sort of uh, hoop houses and things like this early in the season to create microclimates over particular beds where I want to start something early. And I've got lots of videos on that. Um, but another thing you can do is affect things in your garden that gather heat. So uh, some of my beds are bordered by rocks. Rocks gather heat from the sun, they collect that heat and they hold it. So you know, we get snow and rain and ice and all kinds of stuff over the course of the winter here. And uh, I've noticed and I've made note of this in videos that the beds that are bordered by rocks tend to thaw out faster, right? They tend to melt quicker. And it's because those rocks are gathering heat to themselves. But another thing I did last year was to make all the pathways in my garden here. Uh, I, I, just, I, I, previously I'd been using wood chips because it's nice and quiet. I can get them for next to nothing. They, they suppress weeds, um, you know, you have to apply a new layer of them every year in the walking paths to, to keep the, you know, just to keep everything under control. But last year I came to the idea that uh, maybe if I put sand down it might be as effective as a weed suppressor, but also that sand would gather heat to itself because really sand is tiny rocks, right? Think about it that way. So I, I spent some money, I, I can't remember what it was exactly, something in the neighborhood of 500 bucks and I, I spent about 100 bucks because I paid a young guy to wheelbarrow it all down. You can't back a truck up to my garden here, everything has to be wheelbarrowed in. The garden is about 50 yards from my house for those that don't know that. Um, so I put this sand all in the walkways of my garden. Um, on the one hand, to sand's a really good weed suppressor, <laughs> weed seed lands in sand it really can't, if the sand's deep enough, it really can't germinate. It's like a desert, right? The sand's dry, it's always dry. Uh, if you go deep enough into the sand, it gets wet, but the seed is sitting on the top of the sand and it just can't germinate. It just bakes in the sun and loses viability by virtue of that. And so a lot of your weed seeds are taken care of by the sand. So I put a, basically, I got a 2,500 square foot garden, give or take, and I put about a dump truck's worth of sand in the walking paths here. <coughs> It did at least as good a job at suppressing weeds as wood chips. Uh, I think if I put it on a little thicker, and I'm gonna add some more this year, uh, it would have suppressed them even better. But another main advantage of having sand in all your walking path paths is, in a sense, you're turning your walking paths into rock. Sand is rock, it's just tiny rocks. So every walking path is a rock, <laughs> if you wanna think about it that way, and it gathers heat. So the entire garden here is, uh, there, there's, no, uh, there's no snow, there's no ice, you know, like the ground's still frozen, of course, but 
when you come out here on a on a May day, I mean right now it's it's March, but you come out here in the May, June, July, and you go from my yard, which is grass, to the garden here, which has all these sand pathways, it is hot here. You can feel it when you walk here. In the same way that if you go to a beach and you take off your shoes, you notice the sand is unbelievably hot, too hot to walk on some days. The same thing happens here. So all of those tiny rocks are gathering heat and changing the microclimate of my garden. So that's another thing you can do. It costs some money. Um, so you know, if you're doing, if you're on a really small scale, it might not make sense. Certainly, I wouldn't recommend uh, buying bags of sand and putting them down because that gets expensive and there's all that plastic and stuff. Um, but if you're gardening on a larger scale, if you got you know, X number of beds, 10 beds, 20 beds, 30 beds, 40 beds, 50 beds. <laughs> when I say bed, I mean like a four by four by eight bed. Um, and you know, no-till gardeners tend to use beds, right? Uh, you places you walk and places you don't walk. And the places you don't walk are the beds where all the growing takes place. Um, you can use the sand. Uh, but another thing you can do is take a look around the space and look at the trees that are casting shade on your garden. And I mean, we, we, we want our trees, and certainly where I am gardening here, uh, I want the trees because it's, as you can tell, I hope the sound quality isn't too bad, there is always wind here. Uh, when I wake up in the morning at sunrise, it tends to be pretty quiet. There isn't too much wind. I, I like to do my filming at that point in, in the day. But um, within a few hours, I mean, it's probably around 9 a.m. right now, the wind picks up and it just it just gets windier and windier and windier and windier and it really doesn't die down until sometime after sunset. It's always windy here. So if you've got all that wind, it actually lowers the overall temperature of the microclimate where your garden is. So you want trees bordering, surrounding your garden to, to be a wind block. But the flip side of that is that the trees cause shade. And of course that also depends on the kind of tree we're talking about, right? So, you know, I've got a mix, I guess, of uh, uh, coniferous and deciduous trees, you know, evergreens and, uh, you know, the other kinds of trees like um, birch and maple and that sort of the alders, right? So the alders aren't blocking any, you know, none of the deciduous trees, leafy trees, are blocking any sun right now in March because they don't have any leaves on them. They don't really become uh, part of the equation until, um, oh, I don't know, June or July. Um, but all year the evergreens, they don't lose their foliage. So you've got that, <coughs> you've got that foliage in the way. And where I live, Nova Scotia, Canada, we've got a lot of spruce, fir, maple, uh, you know, all those sorts of different evergreens and they cast shade all year long. So uh, I thought I, today I would show you uh, some ideas I have about even, you know, taking my garden even a little bit further and removing some of that and things you can do with an evergreen tree that will change the way <coughs> the evergreen tree casts shade on your garden but preserve the way that the evergreen blocks the wind coming into your garden uh, because wind dissipates heat, <laughs> right? So. Uh, let me show you, uh, we, we just had a huge uh, sort of snow wind storm the other day, an enormous tree uh, sort of tipped over and I had to use a block and tackle a bunch of stuff to cut it down. But that tree is down now and it's not gonna cast anywhere near as much shade. And because of that, I'm noticing other trees that are casting shade. And I have an idea of how you can decrease the shade that an evergreen, spruce in this case, uh, casts on your garden without killing the tree. By, you can maintain the tree, but decrease the shade it throws in your garden. Maybe instead of it throwing shade on your garden, you know, three hours a day, it only throws shade on your garden one hour a day. That makes a huge difference to a plant that gets all its energy from the sun, right? I mean, we're, we're animals. We eat things that gather energy, right? You eat a plant, the plant gathered energy from the sun, you eat the plant, you get the energy. Uh, if you eat an animal, you're eating an animal that ate a plant <laughs> that gathered energy from the sun. Or you're eating an animal that ate an animal that gathered <laughs> energy from the sun. Um, so all these things are trying to gather energy from the sun. Uh, you want them around because they'll block the sun. You want them around because they'll block the wind. 
but you don't want them blocking the sun. So uh, let me show you something here. I'm going to show you a tree that I cut the top off of years ago. It's a, a spruce tree and it's doing fine and it's just changed the way the tree looks. So here's a tree that as you can tell I have a uh, clothesline attached between that tree and my deck. Right? And I wanted a clothesline to dry clothes without, you know, using electricity. Right? And uh, this tree was in just the right spot relative to my deck to uh, attach a clothesline to it. But when I started thinking about doing that, people said, don't do that because the tree will sway in the wind and it'll pull your deck right off your house or it'll weaken or diminish the integrity of your deck and that sort of thing. So then I thought, well, what can I do to decrease how much uh, wind this tree grabs when the wind's blowing? And what I did was I, I went up on a ladder and I cut the top off the tree. Um, so there's, there's two trees here. So one's high, the, the, the tree right up there, where you can see the tip, that's a different tree, it's next to this tree. But the tree that has the clothesline attached to it, I cut the top off of it. And I mean, you know, uh, eight years ago. <laughs> And you can see it's nice and green. So look at it from different angles. It's almost like a giant bonsai tree. Right? And th that tree is going to keep trying to send a branch. I mean, a tree has a certain amount of uh, branches and foliage it wants to gather light. So, I mean, there's the tree adjacent to it. But there's the tree I cut the top off of. And, you know, every so many years, It'll actually send a branch up because it's trying to get higher. And I'll just, uh, I, I've got a, uh, a pruning saw that's attached to a very long stick. And I'll just pull one of those branches off so I can see one. I don't know how obvious it is. But um, you've got the main tree here. And this little thing right there, that's this tree trying to send something. It's trying to establish a new top. Right, so sometime this year I'll, I'll pop that off. Because I just want it to stay like this and I don't know how many years it's going to last like this but hopefully you know these trees are very long lived but the tree is very healthy and it's doing very well so I think you know if you do it the right way if you leave enough green healthy branches on an evergreen you can take the top off and the tree will still survive and I've got other trees in my property that are like this so here's a tree that's a good example of that you know it's about um, oh six inches in diameter the the trunk and uh i don't know what happened to it maybe another tree fell on it but it is very healthy and it's very green but it, it has no top and it's doing fine um, but in terms of like breezes blowing laterally it's about six or seven feet high it's it's an excellent wind block uh, as it is and it's doing very well even though it's a spruce tree um, even though it really has no top and you know it's trying to establish new tops but it's not doing that. Uh, here's an enormous tree that uh, tipped over so the, the root ball there the whole tree just tipped right over in a big sort of snow ice wind storm we had oh I don't know a number of weeks ago and uh, I had to use a block and tackle and some rope and stuff like that to, it was it was leaned heavily this way like I don't know 25 degrees so no wedging would really solve that it was leaned too far for wedges to make a tip this way so I just I was doing this by myself but I attached a, a, a rope to the tree and controlled the fall I tightened the rope as much as I could using uh, various means I was gonna film it but uh, it was just one of those things where it was so difficult to film it it was so dangerous to do that uh, <coughs> I didn't want to add the as uh, the layer of uh, distraction of filming to the uh, imminent danger of uh, cutting this thing down by myself using uh, you know all this rope loaded up with with tension and stuff like that I got to dis dismantle all that but this was an enormous tree that uh, in the gardens over there right and this tree was casting an enormous amount of shade of course I cut this thing down but right next to it and the reason I'm mentioning this is, a, is another tree this one right here uh, a living tree that's in great shape that has no top I don't know why the top broke off or what happened with that tree what deformity happened 
but the tree right here has no top and I'm fine with that tree being there it, it's casting a little bit of shade on my garden but it's also a home for birds and things like that and the birds do a lot of good in my garden I know people have a hate on for birds in their garden but uh, I think uh, on the whole at least where I am the birds are more of a benefit than a problem I think they eat a lot of my slugs and snails and uh, solve more problems than they cause yes they scratch the soil up and they can affect uh, some seeds that are germinating but on the whole I think the work the birds do to eat slugs and snails uh, uh, makes it worthwhile to make your garden a place birds want to be and I have a lot of birds in my garden during the growing season and I'm fine with them being here I did a video ages ago <coughs> called I don't need ducks because whenever I talk about slugs and snail, snails people say you need ducks and I'm like not everyone can have ducks in their yard <laughs> Jeez. You know, some people just live somewhere where they just uh, do you know whatever uh, uh, you know whatever uh, what's that called you know the rules that your your town has for what you can have on your property or your street or that sort of thing um, I, I don't know that I can have ducks here it also adds a complication to my life that I'm not really in the mood to handle but um, having uh, uh, the birds they sort of do the work that ducks or chickens would do in the garden anyway because um, they're they're after for the most part I don't find them to be after the seeds they're after the pests uh, which is great but here's another tree where the, the top is removed and it's doing fine so today I have a tree where I'm gonna take the top off and I think the tree's gonna be fine I'm gonna film that so uh, I may have mentioned this before in some of my garden videos but I, I have read Permaculture One, that's uh, David Holmgren and uh, Bill Mollison's book, and uh, Permaculture Two by just Bill Mollison, I think. Um, it's a good read, and I think if you look around, you could probably find Permaculture Two for free for download. Just just do a search, Permaculture Two, Bill Mollison, do a Google search. You'll probably find a PDF that you can download for free, which is great. <laughs> So if you read these books and you look at all these ideas uh, around permaculture, and I don't get too technical with this because I think the discussions tend to get too technical, but one of the comments is just observe and interact. And one of the themes you get from the book is just sit down and have a look at your garden and look at the space and think. Look and think and look and think and look and think. And I can't, rem I can't recommend enough building some sort of bench to have in your garden where you sit and just be in the space <laughs> for a certain amount of time every once in a while and look around and see what's going on uh, you know whether you're having a, a cup of tea or a cold beer or whatever you're going to do uh, you're going to notice some things and so I'm sitting in the garden right now sorry for the wind um, and uh, south is this way and the sun is over there right now it's the morning it's around 10 a.m. in the morning the sun's over here it's gonna go over there and then it's gonna go over there because it's that time of year where the Sun where I live Nova Scotia Canada is you know rising and setting primarily in the south so most of the Sun comes from that direction early in the season which is when you're trying to get things to germinate but also for the most part the prevailing winds where I live comes out of the uh, west the southwest that direction over there so I want the Sun to get out my gut I want a free path between the Sun and my garden southeast south and southwest but south and southwest I also want the wind block so I want my trees there but I don't want them too high because they're gonna filter the sun and diminish the amount of sun that actually gets on my soil and gets on my plants and the plants need it. So let me just show you here what I'm looking at. So over here I got a tree. I'm not quite sure why but the top it just I didn't take the top off of that tree but it has no top. So that tree's not going to really get any higher. There's a tree next to it that's climbing. Um, but right there is that huge tree that I, that just uh, sort of sla fell down slash was cut down. So that one's out of the, that was an enormous tree. And I'm going to get a lot of wood out of that tree. Um, but that's out of the equation now. I got this stand of trees over here, which I really can't do much about. And I'm inclined to just leave them. 
yes they block some some but they're not right next to the garden and I've got this tree right here that's relatively close to the garden it's about six feet from the edge of the garden and it's about 20 30 feet high and I'm gonna cut the top off of that tree let me take you a little bit closer you can see in here I got these I don't know what this is it's some sort of wild cherry tree of some kind I don't know exactly what it is but I've got this one right it's like two feet from my fence and that tree wants to grow up and every year I just did this maybe two weekends ago uh, I cut the branches that are reaching up to the sky uh, I'm okay with it going out this way but it's right next to my garden so I don't want it any more than two or three feet higher than my fence it's that way south and I want that Sun getting in and when it actually puts on its foliage it puts a lot of foliage on because it's trying to create berries and stuff like that so I cut the I basically prune this tree down every year I do the same do it's hard for me to see because the Sun but there's a tree right there I do the same thing with that tree I sort of prune it down it look looks like an apple tree right but it's not it's just some sort of wild cherry tree so I'm okay with trees being right next to my fence but I'm trying to keep them to a maximum of maybe two or three feet higher than the fence so that they block the moon when they got their leaves on but they don't block the Sun too much right I'm it's, it's about finding that striking that balance but here I've got this tree up here and it's relatively close to the garden I'd say it's 12 feet from the edge of the garden and it's it's just growing and growing and growing and it's very healthy and it's very green and you know I'm sure the birds love it and the squirrels love it and everything loves it but it is casting shade so what I'm gonna do is take the top off of this tree as high as I can sort of reach um, to minimize the amount of Sun or a shade it casts on my garden all right, so I found a vantage point where I think I can get at that tree uh, while standing on the ground. So I've got this tool here. This is a tool that uh, orchardists would use. It's, it's basically a, a curved saw attached to uh, a stick. <laughs> the total length of this thing, saw blade included, I'm six feet. So 10 feet I would say from bottom to top is, is the total reach and then if you've got your own arms and your own reach so maybe 11 or 12 feet you know maybe 11 feet functional because you, you got to have your strength you got to have some degree of ability to pull on this thing the fact that it's got a, a curve to it, uh, it, it it when you're standing above but it's pushing down on you get a bit of a an extra purchase so we, you don't have to push down on it. It, it, it it grabs whatever you're trying to cut fairly well uh, so could I climb up a ladder and cut the top off of this tree yes I have an extension ladder I could do that um, but, but the level of danger and I'm home by myself I got the day off today but there's no one here if I fell off a ladder hurt myself really bad there's really no one I could you know be all up to me I have to crawl my way out of the situation <laughs> so assuming I could even crawl um, so uh, the safer route is to use one of these things. I, I can't remember what I paid for this thing. Maybe 50 bucks, maybe less. It costs about the same as a cheap 20 foot ladder, I would say. Um, but this thing has saved me uh, an incredible amount of work. Anywhere where you might need a ladder, you can use something like this to get up into the upper branches of a tree to, to limit or, or to lop the top off, that sort of thing. Uh, so it's totally uh, worth buying something like this if you've got a lot of trees and you're trying to manage them manage their height and that sort of thing um, so uh, y yeah so uh, I found a spot here luckily there's a there's a big uh, rock this you can't tell but this is a rock covered in moss a lot of the rocks where I live are covered in moss so I can add another you know from, from where I'm standing right now to this rock it's an extra two feet so I can get two feet higher and I can find a spot on that tree where I can cut it from where I've taken the top off but I've allowed the tree to live so I can get that both best of both worlds blocking the wind but letting the Sun in so let me zoom up here and I'll show you how this will work you know it's would I have more control if I was standing on a ladder with uh, you know a saw and cutting it yes I, I could cut it exactly the way I want to cut it would it be easier if I was on a ladder with a chainsaw yes but the danger you add to the equation by climbing a ladder with a chainsaw is incredible could you do it sure if you're feeling brave but 
uh, there's heroes, for, there's graveyards full of heroes, as they say. And when things go wrong with chainsaws, they go really wrong, <laughs> right? So I'd rather just work a little harder and, and stay on the terra firma and use my hands and use my feet and get it this way. And I think the tree will be fine regardless. So uh, let's zoom the camera out and uh, see how long this takes to do. I would say where I'm trying to cut this, the diameter is about four inches of spruce. All right, so I found the angle I want to cut from. I, I'm trying to cut this on, a, on an angle so it's not perfectly flat. It's got a bit of a slope so that water can... I don't want water um, gathering in the stump that I'm going to leave on this. Try to use the, the full length of the saw. I won't lie to you, it's, it's physically demanding if you've got a heart condition or any kind of infirmity. Uh, this may not be for you, but if you're in reasonably good health, I'm a 47 year old man, uh, it's doable. I'm about halfway through now, maybe a little bit more. Try to use the full length of the saw. Try to use your body and your momentum as you're doing it. And try to remember to breathe, <laughs> like they say in yoga. I don't do yoga, but that's what they say. It's, uh, it's good advice for just about anything, breathing. All right, we're just about through here. So now, as I'm getting towards the edge, I'm going to give more, take a minute to catch my breath here. I'm going to use very, very hard pulls to make sure it comes off clean. I don't want the top coming off the tree and stripping a bunch of bark off the area below it, off the area below the hinge. I want to get it as clean as I can. So, really sharp pulls here. All right, we're free, but <laughs> of course it doesn't want to fall. Uh, I'm just going to reverse the saw and try to use the, the butt to push it. Uh, of course it doesn't want to cooperate. Try it from this angle here. And of course it rests on the next branch. Push it off with the butt. Trying to be safe with the blade. Now this is real stuff. Things don't always happen uh, perfectly. You just work it out. You know if I I got lots of themes for this gardening channel and uh, one of them would just be a guy with a garden trying to work stuff out. Oh god, I just broke a branch. Oh well. We're almost there. I almost got it. Luckily the evergreen, evergreen tree can take a bit of bending. Evergreens are tough trees. It wants to go. There we go. Now let's just go around the other side here. let there be light right we've taken the top off of that tree from where I'm standing this is not the garden this is where my goldfish palm would be technically I guess but you can see that light was coming through that wasn't coming through before and for my garden that will be a good thing 
and I think because I've left enough branches on that tree I think it will just uh, needle out I can't say leaf out because it's a needle tree uh, needle out and uh, continue to persist in that form kind of like a bonsai I guess in a sense right it'll just continue on in that way and uh, block the wind that's going to my garden while at the same time letting the sun through and hopefully that'll have a huge effect so <laughs> Just one more day in the garden here at Maritime Gardening. Uh, you know, the ground's still pretty frozen. I got a few beds with uh, domes over them, uh, and it's, it's so early in the morning, I need to wait a little bit before I can work the soil. I, I got some plans to do some stuff in the garden today. We'll see how the day goes. But while I'm waiting for that, this time of year, you can have a look around your garden and see what things you can do to improve the success in your garden. If you've got trees that are casting shade in your garden, you can reduce the amount of shade that tree casts on your garden without killing the tree. You're just changing the way the tree grows to a way that you want it to grow. And there's nothing wrong with that. And uh, especially if it's your own land, you can do whatever you want anyway. I could cut the whole tree down, but I want the tree there. I want it to block the wind and I want it to be a good habitat for the the birds and various living things that are here. So I hope you found that interesting. If you did, please like, share, subscribe. Check out my podcast, MaritimeGardening.com. And until next time, get out there, get at it, have fun in your garden. Thanks for watching. <laughs>